If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it still make a sound? And if something tragic were to happen to you in the middle of nowhere, how would anyone know about it? These hypothetical questions should keep you on your toes in preparation to embrace the night. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number 1. When I was in my early 20s, I had a friend with a psychotic alcoholic father. She didn't live with him. He lived in a remote little coastal town. Now and again, we would go to visit him and stay the night. My relationship with him was creepy in itself, but that isn't the subject. One night we were visiting my friend and her dad. He had a drunken blow up and he kicked us out of the house. It was around midnight and we had gotten a lift down and didn't have a car. My friend's dad lived about four kilometers out of town, which was no more than a huddle of two or three shops by way of a dirt road. We started walking down the dirt road to town. There was a telephone booth and this was in the days before it was commonplace to have a mobile phone. I was going to call my folks, who lived about an hour and a half away, and see if they would be willing to come and collect us. The whole way to town, my friend was drunkenly moaning and crying about her broken relationship with her father, and she hadn't let up by the time we got to the phone booth. She sat on a bench next to the phone, whilst I woke my parents. They agreed to come and collect us, and I sat down on the bench for the long wait. Shortly after this, a van appeared and parked just behind the bench we were sitting on, maybe five meters away. There were two young men in the front seats, and they were just looking at us. If that didn't make me nervous enough, the van door slid open and I saw that there were a number of young guys in the back. I don't remember how many, but definitely more than two. The place that we were sitting was deserted. There were no houses nearby, just more road, no people, nowhere to run, and no one driving by. It was a shitty little nowhere town out in the middle of nothing. I stood up so that I could see them better, and kept my eyes fixed on the van full of men acutely aware of our vulnerability. What I saw was that they were looking back at us. They were talking amongst themselves, quietly at first. Then they started speaking more and more loudly. It became evident that they were deliberately speaking loudly enough for us to hear. They were talking about pulling us into the van and taking us somewhere in order to rape and kill us. I can't remember the exact words, but that was definitely the gist of it. As you can imagine, my whole body was quaking with terror. I couldn't take my eyes off the men. I remember the face of one of them so clearly, I could draw it now. He was just sitting at the door of the van, looking at me with no expression, looking at me with dead eyes, looking at me like I was a thing. At this time, my drunken friend hadn't stopped sobbing to herself. Whether she knew the van was there or not, I couldn't say. I knew I had to tell her about the danger, but I was actually so full of terror myself that I couldn't move, nor could I speak. That was when the most incredible thing happened. My father's friend, who has never apologized to anyone in his life, and who is the most awkward prick alive, appeared. Drunk and in his car. It was hard to describe how unlikely it was for him to do this. He could hold a grudge like no one you've ever met. He was a stubborn guy, and he and my friend had an emotional reunion. The whole time, my eyes were fixed on the van. The men had stopped talking and were just watching us. 
Let's go, I said, and we got back in the car and started heading for my friend's dad's house. The van started up and began pursuing us. I tried to explain to my friend's father about the men, but he said, I'll just slow down and they can pass. They slowed to a crawl behind us. Then they began to shout out of the window screaming threats. They followed us all the way down that dirt road, and then all the way down the driveway of my friend's dad's house. They just sat in the van behind us, and we sat in the car, waiting to see what would happen. All of my friend's dad's neighbours were holiday homes, and nobody was in that night. We knew that if a group of men decided to get out of the van and carry out their threats, there would be no one to get help from. After a very long and painful time, the van backed out of the driveway and they left. My parents came in a panic to the house when they couldn't find us at the shops. My friend's dad hid in shame and I went back to my family's house. I've been asked if I went to the police, but I can't remember. I don't think I did. It was a very chaotic time in my life. But that incident changed me forever. I am a very fearful person now, and very overprotective of my own kids. And I don't want to change, because I'd rather be like this than accidentally trust one of the million psychos out there. I worked at a campground on night shift, from 12am to 8am, every night. It wasn't bad. I would bring my PS2 and game a good portion of the night. And I only had to deal with about one or two people on busy nights. It was just me and this little 8x8 shack, with nothing around but dark all night. My first week there, the other third shift guy who was quitting, told me about this payphone a few feet away from the shack where I worked. He said it rang every night at 4.17am, just once. It was probably just an automated test call, he guessed. He's never answered it himself. I go for a few months with the job. It was the middle of summer, so most nights I had the windows closed, so I couldn't hear the payphone go off. Mid-August, I started leaving the windows open during the night. And sure enough, at 4.17am every morning, the phone would ring once. The ring even sounded creepy, like the payphone was submerged in water, and then put where it sat. One night I got the nerve to answer it. I set an alarm for 4.15, and I would go wait at the phone until it rang. When it did, I answered it, but there was no sound. Just dead air, like the someone was on the other line, but wasn't answering. I said hello a few times, and hung up. I did this every night for a week with the same results. I didn't think anything of it, and left it alone after about a good month. The first week of October though, I decided to answer the phone once again. I set my alarm, and when the time came I answered the phone. Hello? Hello? Then I heard what sounded like someone inhaling through clenched teeth. The voice that sounded was rough, and sounded like he had gargled gravel. The best comparison I can give is Horace P. Gage from The Suffering. He said my name, my complete name, first, middle, and last. It was a voice I had never heard. My voice caught in my throat and I hung up. I rattled some change into the payphone and hit star 69. The number had come from California, and I live in Indiana. Number 3 So, I used to live in a part of Memphis, Tennessee, that was a little shaky. It was right on the edge of what some would consider the ghetto. But there was also a nearby part that was pretty secluded and desolate. 
and I lived in the outskirts of the city, kind of near the industrial part near Raleigh for anyone familiar. Anyway, I was an eight-year-old boy when this happened, and my sister was five years my senior. The two of us went for walks on occasion. This time, we went to the back of the house division, and further than we'd gone before. This area was pretty dirty and desolate for such a city. Just train tracks and nearby industrial facilities. Lots of dry tan grass coming through spots in the railroad gravel. Lots of dusty crap people dumped illegally around the tracks. There used to be a pack of stray dogs that frequented my local neighbourhood. But other than that, no people or cars would ever really be seen out there. Not that far behind my neighbourhood anyway. We were just walking along the tracks, talking, throwing rocks, when I saw some strange movement just beyond the tree line of this small wooded area, about 40 feet ahead of my 11 o'clock position. I told my sister to look as we walked a bit closer. We had made it about 10 or 15 feet away from the wooded area when we realised that movement was a fact when we realised the movement was in fact a mime. A mime in the middle of nowhere, seemingly hidden amongst the trees and thick dead vines that adorned the edge of the wooded area. Painted face, black striped shirt with black pants. He had an exaggerated expression of a mime too. His eyes got wide and he seemed to start performing for us. He was kind of doing it in a way to attract us, maybe entice us beyond that small wall of thick brush and vines, and into the wooded area in which he stood, or lurked, to be more precise. I honestly couldn't tell you much about him, as we ran away very quickly. I do remember that it was a very hot day out, and his makeup was pretty dingy and gross, as were all his clothes. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable. I sometimes wonder who the mime was. Perhaps he was there to kidnap children, but who knows what could have happened if we'd have gone into that thicket. And why there? He was just simply insane. His mind was gone, which is far more creepy than any kidnapping stranger. Number four. I used to work for the National Park in Pennsylvania. My job was toll collection. The shift started at 3am. My duty was to assess a small fee from commercial vehicles traversing the park at that godforsaken hour. The neat thing is the first commercial vehicle wouldn't really start coming in until about 5 or 6. With a few regulars who were always in there before, it was the best job and very well paid for what you had to do. The only difficulties would be staying awake and not allowing your imagination to run away with you and creeping yourself out. The booth was right next to the Delaware River. So in the early mornings, the fields and the roads and the woods would take on a mist that hung close and low to the ground, like ghostly white hedges. Staying awake was hard but the second difficulty was the worst. I would write horror stories whilst in the booth. The setting was too creepy not to channel what I was writing. One night, as I was typing out a few paragraphs, I had this crazy feeling that I was being watched. It was a night with mist like I described. It was cold too. I think it was November, as it must have been that I was home from college at the time. I looked around, sort of bleary-eyed and couldn't shake the feeling. The booth was a box that sat squatly in the middle of the road going south on Route 209. A small parking lot was off to the left, and the windows allowed you to see up into the small parking lot and fee assessment lane, the road up, and the travel lane. Like a dunce, I sat there looking up the road and looking out into the travel lane and I couldn't see anything but the white mist and the lone street light about a quarter of a mile up the road. After a few moments, 
I looked to my left to the parking lot and the assessment lane to see if anything was there. Nothing. I stood up to get a better look, and when I did, a head of horns and nostrils popped in front of the window and scared the living shit out of me. A deer had wandered up to the booth and had been sort of grazing at the grass near the door. I screamed like a little girl when I saw him, and he just sort of meandered away quickly. I had no further need for coffee that morning. Number 5 When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labour to rural areas of Australia. Basically, what you did was tell them that you were available and they'd send you to a remote farm for a few weeks, where you would do whatever they needed done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay, and good fun if you got in with a nice group of workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property. I was told it covered roughly the same landmass as the state of Maryland, USA. It was about a nine hour drive from Sydney, and the property itself was about 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was in the middle of nowhere. I was working at the farm clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the same city. Our boss was a guy called Jeremy, who owned the farm and supervised us whilst helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot, and the work was hard. So one day when the temperature hit around 38, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew of a waterhole on the farm about 25 minutes drive north. I was keen for a swim, but the other guys just wanted to relax for the afternoon. So him and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading across the property. It was mostly wild, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker, so we drove more or less in silence. After around 20 minutes, however, he suddenly perked up and jabbed me in the ribs. Do you see that over there? beneath the two dead trees. I should mention here that if you're not familiar with inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown or red and mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colours stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction and as we got closer, we realised it was a huge blue shipping container, just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was genuinely perplexed. I asked him if he knew how it got there, but obviously he didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove there about five weeks earlier, and he wanted to go see what it was. Initially, we pulled to a stop about a hundred metres away from it. At this stage, I had a really bad feeling the whole thing wasn't right. It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expanse, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate, which I understood, given that it was his property, but in truth I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it, thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side of it. All motion activated, so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, with all this security, someone obviously doesn't want us here, let's go. He brushed me off, however, reminding me that it was his farm, and whoever had put this here was trespassing, so he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, 
there was only a small padlock on the huge door. We had some bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see that this was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place, and the sort of hum that you could hear when a hard drive was working. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated, albeit somewhat cluttered, office setup. There were hard drives the size of a bar fridge, and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high, and plastic storage boxes scattered around the wall, and several desks with computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage, I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desk to see if the computers could give any idea of what the hell was going on. My heart was racing, and I just wanted to bolt. We had been seen by CCTV, so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy, on the other hand, was adamant to get to the bottom of it. So I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while, but in short, neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word, and the best I can describe from my lay position is that it was endless lists of computer talk. It was like the old Napster or LimeWire download, just continually picking up and receiving data, then recording it on several windows. I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over to the far end of the container, to the big pile of storage boxes. By then, I was pretty sure no one else was there, as there was nowhere really to hide. But I was still incredibly on edge. I decided against my better judgement to see what was inside all of these boxes. My brief sift through this box made me feel sick to the stomach. It didn't take long for me to realise that the box was full of posters, DVDs and photos, all of hardcore child pornography. One thing that still gets to me is that it was all neatly ordered in folders and smaller boxes. Those people were organised. I immediately recoiled, jumped over and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string a sentence together. I said something to the effect of, Mate, get out. Child sex, just get out. I dragged him out, composed myself, and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile phone reception, and we hadn't bought the satellite phone, so we had to go back to his landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make their way to the farm from the nearest police station which was a town about a half hour from the closest town to the farm. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen, until the cops arrived almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and led them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got there, the container door was open and there was a fire inside. We only had two small fire extinguishers in the car, and it did very little. The fire department took an hour to get there, by which stage most of the damage was already done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described, and only traces of paper and cardboard. That means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property, and the landmass was huge, so there was no real way to tail them. Since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first place, probably due to our poor explanation on the phone, aerial surveillance was also impossible by the time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who may be responsible. The investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still there on the farm, 
as it's too expensive to move. But I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. Number six. Three of us were finishing up a 20 mile hike. Two of us were back further and now one friend ran ahead to warm up the car. I stayed back with our friend who was a little slower and tired. Basically, it was dark by the end of our hike and I peered my headlamp off into the grass and about 50 feet away, I saw its glowing yellow eyes staring at me. I kept my light on it and began to yell at it until I saw the eyes disappear. Then another 20 minutes go by and I hear my friend ahead of us yelling, so I yelled back. When I find him sitting on the side of a trail, shaking and wet. His headlamp died and he lost his trail somewhere around the river crossing. And once he found the trail again, he decided to just wait for us. Whilst he was waiting, he could hear the mountain lion stalking him. He could hear it about 15 feet away from him moving closer and closer, but couldn't see anything. He said he heard it take off running as soon as he heard me yell back at him. We came to the conclusion that there were two of them and they had probably been stalking us together ever since sunset. Pretty freaky experience knowing you're being stalked by an animal that you know is intending to kill you. You just have to hope that they are either not hungry and desperate enough or that they think you're stronger than you really are. Number seven. I was in the summer camp of my Boy Scout troop, but with both boys and girls. As all are here in Spain, scouting here is actually quite a liberal thing. One of the most important activities during the summer camp is what we call the raid. Basically going out of the camp to adventurously trek for a couple of days. My friend and I planned an amazing route through a beautiful mountain range called Los Pirineos in the northeast of Spain. Three days walking and two nights sleeping out of the camp. My raid group consisted of 15 boys and girls, all between the ages of 12 and 14. We took food with us and knew how to read a map, how to build shelter and how to search for water and pretty much anything necessary to survive for a couple of days. So no adults were coming with us, and I know that that doesn't happen anymore. Our plan for the first day was to climb a mountain that was just under 3,000 meters, or 10,000 feet high, and sleep by a glacial lake near the top of it. It was a long walk from our camp, about 25 kilometers, and quite steep. So at about 6 p.m., we decided that we were not going to reach the lake at a prudent time. So we found a nice place to build a shelter and then cooked some dinner. We were in the middle of a beautiful mountain, about 10 kilometers from the nearest road and about five kilometers more to the closest village. We couldn't have been happier. We had nearly two hours until sunset when we finished our meal. So we thought it would be a good idea to send a smaller group to clean dishes and refill water to a spring that we had seen whilst walking. I volunteered to go and three other friends joined me. We got a couple of light torches just in case and headed towards the fountain. Night came whilst we were on our way back to the shelter. We could hear the rest of the group singing and having fun in the distance. Suddenly, one of my friends stopped and pointed at something just by the side of our trail that wasn't there on our way down. There was a light reflecting pole from the road torn into pieces. We went from being happy and relaxed to being mildly scared in just a second and rushed all the way to where our friends were and we told them about our creepy finding. We were just kids 
So fear escalated quite quickly. Who could be hiding in the same mountain as we were? And why? Two of the older 14 year old boys thought it would be a good idea to go look around to try and calm us down. Although, being without them was even scarier. They went away with a light torch, a knife and a whistle, so that they could hear further apart if they were in trouble. We remained seated inside the shelter, which was nothing more than a couple of tarps held by sticks near a big boulder, silent and petrified. I remember hearing quite a lot of sobbing around me. I was thinking I didn't want to die there. One of the girls suggested that we should sing to try and think of something else. Some disapproved because we might not hear the whistles, but we did anyway, although not very loudly. We spent about 20 minutes doing that. All of a sudden, a whistle interrupted our song. We had heard it very clearly. Two whistles coming towards us at a very fast pace. I remember taking my knife from its sheath and keeping it in my hands. Luckily, it was our friend. They arrived nervous and exhausted from the run, and they told us that they had stumbled upon a long stick standing with lots of blood all over it. More than what our nerves can stand, most of us started crying, some praying too. They told us that we were going to go look for whoever was in the mountain with us and confront him. In case things go bad, we'll run somewhere so that he can't find you, one said. We asked them to stay, but nobody was able to move a finger to actually stop them from leaving. There was no more singing, only weeping and barely audible prayers. I just didn't want to die there. I wanted to see my family. After a while, we heard some noises, followed by the familiar voices of our friends. They came back at a calm pace, with relief in their faces. It was all just a misunderstanding, one explained. It's just a park ranger. We found him, and he explained to us that he was just walking around as part of his duty, and the bloody stick was just from a rabbit he had hunted for dinner. That was quite a relief. Someone even spoke about taking out our sleeping bags and going to sleep. That sounded wonderful. But it wasn't long until one of the older guys said he was a bit suspicious. You see, he wasn't wearing a uniform, nor a badge, or anything that could identify him as a ranger. And who walks kilometers away from the closest road late at night to hunt for rabbits? Are there even rabbits at this altitude? Terror hit us all again in another wave. They were right. The story didn't add up. Let's go back and kill him, the older guy said. We asked them to stay with us again, and got the same result. They were gone. Someone said that they might have followed him here, and now knew exactly where we were, and we all shivered in panic. Nobody was paying the slightest attention to anyone else anymore. Nobody cried, nobody prayed. I remember only having one thought. I'd rather kill him than get killed in this place. We waited, silently, and ready to fight for our lives. We all had our knives out and ready. Minutes passed. Suddenly we heard people running, approaching. We heard screams of terror. From the sound of it, it was obvious that there were more than two people coming at us, and I haven't been more scared in my life. I hoped I could say goodbye to my mum, my dad and my sister, and my knife was ready to stab whoever claimed closest to me. We finally saw our two friends running for their lives being followed by two men. They came just at the front of the opening to our shelter and stopped. The two men chasing them did the same, and we could see their faces. They were our camp leaders, who had been following us the whole time but hiding, and the four started laughing at us and asking if we were scared. It was just a joke the whole time. Everyone started crying, and some even had problems to grasp proper breaths due to the anxiety for quite a while. We weren't amused at all. After only a couple of minutes, the four of them had realized what they'd done. They had taken 13 children to the point of holding a knife and being willing to kill with it. We obviously relaxed a lot, but our fear became anger. 
it had been a joke, way out of proportion, of the most basic common sense. They spent quite a long time apologising, but we didn't care. We just wanted them to leave us alone. But on the other hand, we were still too scared to sleep by ourselves. So we reluctantly accepted that they'd come back and sleep with us. It took them months to regain our trust, and it was the worst night of my life. I've never had nightmares about it, but I remember it like it were yesterday. Now that I'm older, I always like to think what would have happened if two guys had have been there to kill us. We were children, true, but armed, and at the final moments, totally willing to kill. We would have chopped them to pieces. Number 8 My dad always tells this story. He doesn't believe in ghosts or any of that, and he's not the kind of person to make things up just to scare us. Which is why this is even creepier. Some backstory. My entire family is from Mexico, and we lived there until a couple of years after I was born. I'm the youngest, so at the time of this story, I hadn't been born. The youngest was my brother. He was around three. The story goes, my two eldest siblings, who were around 10 and 14 at the time, went camping with my aunt and cousins. Mind you, our family isn't the outdoorsy type at all, so this was a rare occurrence for my siblings. They slept in the woods for one night only, and after that they came back. Then, weird things started to happen slowly. We had a pit bull puppy and two parakeets that were always in their cage together. The birds became aggressive towards each other, so much that my mum had to put them in separate cages. This circular burn appeared on the side of my dog, kind of like if a perfect circle had been branded on him. My brother, who was three years old, would talk about seeing a gold elephant, a baby gold elephant. My parents have never believed in the superstitious or the supernatural in any way, so they kind of chose to ignore it. Until a friend, a lady that cleaned my paternal grandmother's house, visited them and said something was off. She said that there was an extremely negative energy in the house. She asked if they had been to the woods or the forest and my parents explained that the two oldest children had gone camping for the night. The woman said that they had brought something back from there. A day later, the woman brought a rosary and holy water, along with a man, it may have been a shaman or a curandero. The man told my parents to get a small bowl and some alcohol. They put the bowl on the ground poured the alcohol into it and set it on fire, waiting in the living room as instructed, whilst the man and the woman went around the whole house blessing it. My dad tells me that when they'd get to certain places in the house, where the birds were kept in the patio and my brother's bedroom for example, the fire would shoot up two feet higher. The bowl was smaller than a dog's dish and they had only poured a couple of tablespoons of alcohol. Afterwards, the man instructed my dad to keep an egg, just out of the carton, not boiled or anything, in a small plate under their bed for three days. On the third day before sunrise, my dad had to take it to a place where no one in my family would ever go again. The man said that he should leave it in a corner, turn around, and that no matter what he heard, he should not turn around. My dad did so. On the third day, he chose an alleyway in the part of the city that no one knew, and that his family never had any reason to go to. He put the plate on the ground, turned around and walked away. He said he heard people whispering to him, and that there had been absolutely no one in the alley. This makes no sense, no sense at all, and the only reason it keeps me up at night is because both him and my mother tell the story and I know that they're not making it up. They don't play those kind of games. 
Number nine. I live in a town of about 11,000 in rural Wisconsin. Not by preference, but for a job. And we are moving when I get a better one. I was on my way to my employer's home. He runs a company out of his basement until we get a new office space. I was being tailgated bad by a ratty blue car by a white bald guy. I drive a Kia Soul, which has a flat back end. So if I can't see your headlights, then you are a mere few inches off my butt and you will get me tapping my brakes. He honked at me, whatever. I flipped him off and slowed down to five miles under the speed limit. There wasn't anyone behind him, so I wasn't ruining anyone else's day. He had chances to pass me on the country road, but didn't. And after a few minutes with no other cars around, and him still kissing my bumper at 50, I grabbed my cell phone and pretended to quickly turn and take a picture of him. Then I pretended to call 911. I was in the country, with no other cars around, literally the middle of nowhere, and this guy was getting creepy. I came to my turn, but decided to see if this guy would follow me. I turned left, and he followed. Then I came to a roundabout, and thought I would lose him. I travelled the entire thing twice, and he followed me. At this point, I knew he was messing with me, trying to scare me. Well, I decided to let myself be late for my meeting. I began to drive to the police station, and he followed me the whole way there. I pulled up and parked, ready to run inside, and I thought he would leave. Nope. He parked right next to me, and just stared at me, and he pulled up on my left side, close enough that I'd have a hard time opening the door. He was in his 40s, wearing sunglasses with a creepy smile, and he was wearing fairly neat clothes. The interior of the car was pristine. I should mention that I'm a training and behaviour analyst, and that I work with kids right now, and my hobby is criminal behaviour, and I was profiling, and I was seriously trying to read this guy. A few seconds went by and I grabbed my phone again. This time intent on calling 911 from the police station parking lot. As I dialed, he rolled his passenger window down, said nothing, rolled it back up, and took off. I went inside and told the officer what happened. Sadly, I was too focused on not crashing to get a plate. Apparently, there had been a lot of complaints about tailgaters recently, multiple, with a blue car. I filled out the report and they gave me a card for victim services at a local women's shelter, just in case he followed me home one night and I didn't feel safe. But I live in a secure building with my fiancé. I went out to my car, and there was a note on my windshield. All it had was a smiley face. Serious horror movie stuff. I took it back inside, and the officer said he'd call me a few times during the night, and that I should avoid going anywhere alone for a while. He did call twice, and said he was patrolling my parking lot during the night shift. This is a small town, and the attitude around here is very communal, so I feel safe in that someone will back me up. If I ever see this guy again, no question, I'll call him 911 and lead him straight to the police station. I also told my fiancé that I will post my work schedule, or even when I have to leave for another reason and that if I don't text him within 10 minutes of my estimated time of arrival, to call 911. Number 10. This happened when I was 16 years old, and driving home, which is situated in the middle of nowhere. I was just going along, and listening to the radio even though I hated what was on but it was just to pass the time as I drove through the darkness. You need to understand that there is a gate that you need to use before you enter our driveway. And just as I was approaching it, I saw a man standing at my gate. Now I have a key fob, so I don't have to punch in the code every time I come home. 
I pulled slowly up to my gate and got out of my car. And instead of driving through, I asked him if I could help him. It was at that moment that I noticed that he was a she. And I asked her if she needed me to call anybody. She started crying instead of responding and just fell to the ground. Now I'm trained in first aid and CPR. So I know that if something were to happen, I would be able to assist her instead of just stand there. When I got to her and reached for her hand, I noticed that she was bleeding. I took a few steps back in both shock and worry. Concerned for the poor girl, I told her to get into my car and that I would take her up to the house to get her cleaned up and that I would try and call somebody to collect her. I had to basically carry her to my car. And once I got there, I opened my gate and drove through. Now, my gate automatically closes, so I found it odd when it stayed open, longer than it should have. Once it started to close, I just blew it off as there being something wrong with the sensor. By that time, she had stopped crying and was just looking at me. I was a bit creeped out, but told her that I wasn't going to hurt her. So she settled down once she knew that she was okay and that she was in no danger. We got to my car parking spot and my parents were out of town for the weekend. So I was alone. I brought her into the house and had her sit in my office room so that I could treat her. I also called my cousin Andrea, who was a child life paramedic, since she looked to be quite young, around 18 I'd say. I was cleaning her wounds as I got a call from Andrea. She was approaching and she said that she saw someone walking up my driveway. I asked her what she was talking about. There shouldn't be anyone walking up my driveway. She said that there was a guy. And then I began to get scared. But I didn't show it because I didn't want to freak the girl out. So I asked my cousin in code to inquire to the guy who exactly he was. And when she did, it was revealed that he was allegedly the father of the girl. I asked the girl who her father was, and she said that he had died three years ago. By the time I got in contact with Andrea again, she told me that she had seen the guy run and jump over the fence, which is incredibly hard because it's about nine feet high. The girl was sobbing, and Andrea arrived just in time to check her out. When Andrea arrived, she did an assessment on her, and we found out the girl's name was Austin. We decided to go to the hospital with her, as there was no way I was going to stay home alone after that. We helped her get into the ambulance, and as we were going down my driveway, when we got to the gate, we noticed a parked car near the gate. It's not unusual all the time because there is a church nearby and people will sometimes park there. But as we approached the hospital, we noticed that there was a car behind us. Confident it was the same car. It followed us to the hospital. And as they were taking Austin out the stretcher, he was just parked, staring at us. Andrea lost her shit and went over to ask the guy what the hell he was doing. He drew a knife and slashed my cousin's neck. I freaked out and screamed as Andrea came running back. There was a guard nearby who arrested the man and Andrea was rushed to the ER to get surgery because the guy had cut a vein. I still can't get over what happened.